Amen. Lord Jesus, come. Will you turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11 this morning? Uh, Luke 11, we'll begin in verse 14. As Jesus moves on from what we covered the past couple weeks, the beautiful topic of prayer, which is an amazing topic, right, where our Lord gave us Christians the ever-inspiring instruction that we don't have to persistently pursue with distress and strive for the Lord to hear our prayers, but, but because He is our good Father in heaven, we can be confident He will receive us immediately and answer us according to His will. <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful. It's uplifting and inspiring to know that we can go to Him for all our spiritual and physical needs in life. Amen? And to know, even as we closed with last week, that we have the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God, leading and guiding, sanctifying and empowering our lives. You know, it's remarkable the joy and wonderful hope, strength, peace, good things we have as children of God. Citizens of God's righteous kingdom. Can I get an amen to that? Well, hold on to that. (laughs) Because today we see a whole other side. That there is another kingdom. One that is not so bright and holy. One that is dark and evil. Which is so bizarre, in our verses, Jesus is accused of being from and inspired by. (laughs) The dark and evil kingdom. Spoiler alert, he's not. (laughs) He's not. Jesus is the light of the world. You know, he is the one who delivers people from darkness and into marvelous light. And in this passage, he proves it. As he miraculously restores a demon-possessed man and, by his wise words, silences his critics when they try to contend with him on where his power really comes from. As we, as we begin, let me say, it's never a good idea when people go toe-to-toe debating Jesus because they are not going to win. <laughs> and we clearly see it here. As we also see, the greatest choice in life is to join Jesus' side by placing your life in his hands. Amen? Let's pray and then get into the word. Lord, thank you so much for your love. I just pray, Lord, as we did sing, did sing come, Jesus. Lord, Jesus, come. Lord, we do pray that. Lord, I also pray that you would come right now in this moment. Lord, that your, your, your spirit would fall afresh upon us. Work in this place. Convict us in the areas we need convicting, Lord. Um, inspire us and encourage us in those areas that we need inspiration. Lord, help us to see that you're on the throne. Help us to see that you're with us every step of the way. I even pray, Lord, if someone is, is strayed from you, if someone is not walking with you t- today, Lord, that they would change that, Lord, that they would realize how good you are. <laughs> how faithful, how powerful, how willing you are to take our lives and do great things. We welcome you here to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's begin by reading just verse 14. Luke writes, and he, Jesus, was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was, when the demon had gone out, that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. Stop right there. You know, the, the way this scene begins is very similar to what we've covered numerous times already in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus encountering a person who was in desperate need of him. You know, we've read of him working in the lives by bringing restoration to those who are sick with disease. We've covered him cleansing a leper, healing ones with paralysis, and even a couple times Jesus raising people from the dead. But we've also read about multiple encounters where Jesus delivered people from the clutches of Satan when unclean spirits, demons, had infiltrated people's lives. You know, there was the uh, interruption in the synagogue when Jesus was teaching. There was, of course, legion. I like to call it the bacon situation. (laughs) You know, the time Jesus delivered the man and sent the demons into the pigs, and they went (whistles) off the cliff, remember that? And then, possibly the most heartbreaking of them all, was when a poor child was being violently tormented as his desperate father pleaded for Jesus to help. And here, another tragic situation. A full-fledged assault by an unclean spirit that makes a man mute, speechless, unable to communicate. In Matthew's account, it's revealed the demon also blinded this man as it sought to torment and destroy his life. Which is always what Satan and his minions desire to do. Torment and destroy. Scripture calls Satan a murderer and a liar, who roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And whether he and his subordinates consume a life completely or or are heavily oppressing, their goal is 
always to utterly annihilate lives, to harm, to mislead, and to keep people blinded from coming to faith so that they will be lost forever. But then there's Jesus, <laughs> who can deliver and save by rescuing lives. Jesus is greater. Can I get an amen to that? And not, and not only an amen. Christians, we need to know this. We need to believe this. Jesus is greater. Because sometimes we emphasize the destructive work of the enemy over the mighty, sovereign power of the Lord. And biblically, I don't think we should ever have that mindset. Yes, we are in a spiritual battle. Scripture teaches that. And yes, there is a real enemy that comes to destroy. But our God is greater. <laughs> 1 John 4, 4. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Our God is greater. Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is greater. You know, at the end of Romans 8, the Apostle Paul goes on to tell us about the confidence we Christians are to have in our God. He says this, listen, he says, for I am persuaded, which means I am convinced, I am fully confident that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities and powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. None of these things that we mentioned, including principalities and powers, Satan and his crew, should overwhelm our lives, or our thoughts, for that matter, because we are found in the love of God. <laughs> we are in His arms, in His protection, and He is greater. <laughs> if God is for us, who can be against us? Which means we don't have to be living our lives in this, like, constant paralysis fear of the enemy, you know, thinking like there's a demon under every chair, <laughs> or, you know, you know, if you open the door and walk outside, uh-oh, dark forces are going to consume me, better not open the door, not, nothing like that. You know, honestly, I remember early in my Christian walk, I didn't want to pray any of my struggles out loud because I thought if Satan heard it, then he would hold it against me. Then he would attack me in that way. So I better not say anything to anybody about what I struggle with. I needed to be reminded that God is greater. <laughs> we need to understand that God is greater. That we don't have to live in fear because as, as Jesus covered in the model prayer, we are to, to be praying to our Father in heaven to dad and we get to pray what do we get to pray we get to pray lead us not into temptation but check this out but deliver us from the evil one you know what that means that means he can <laughs> that means he's powerful our heavenly father is greater i love it when i once heard this it's going to stick with me forever our dad can beat up their dad he can intercede and help in our time of need and he will you know parents when, when your kid is going through something and they cry out for help, what do you do? <laughs> Respond, you know, I'm sorry, too busy right now. Or, you know, why don't you just figure it out yourself? Or, I really don't like your behavior as of late, so you don't really deserve my help. No, we don't do that, right? You're going to help them no matter what. So is our dad. <laughs> Which again, again means we are to be looking to him, emphasizing him over what the enemy could do. Is there a spiritual realm? Yes. A real dark side? Yes. Is there an, a powerful enemy, Team Satan, who seeks to destroy. Yes. But Team Satan does not stand a chance against our team leader, <laughs> the captain of our, our salvation, Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen to that? And we see it right here with Jesus. Look at verse 14 again. And he, Jesus, was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out that the mute spoke. Like all other instances that we've read so far, taking care of the enemy is a piece of cake for Jesus, right? You know, there's no struggle or difficult battle between Jesus and and the evil spirit. There's no announcer, you know, getting on the mic going, you know, it, 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 in this corner, you know, the good God man Jesus. In this corner, evil dark demon. The battle will be intense. It will be ongoing. Who will win? It's nothing like that. Jesus walks right up to the demon, casts it out, and restores the man. <laughs> Which makes the onlooking crowd that is gathered around Jesus stand in awe. At the end of verse 14, after Jesus casts out the demon, we read, and the multitudes marveled. My translation is, they looked like this. <laughs> Everything that was going on. They were amazed. They were astonished. And I should say so, right? I mean, this man was completely overwhelmed and overtaken. He was mute. He couldn't speak. He was blind. He couldn't see. But instantly, because of Jesus, this man was totally restored. 
His broken, shattered life was repaired. That's what Jesus can do. He can repair broken, shattered lives. And here the, the multitude marvels at it. In, in Matthew's account, he says, in their amazement, the crowd started asking, could this be the son of David? A reference to the Messiah. And of course, they were correct, as, as many were acknowledging him as a promised one from heaven. But then we come to verse 15 and 16, <laughs> where we read this. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. It's like, wait, wait, what? People were actually making the accusation that Jesus was influenced by evil when he set this man free. You know, there are in fact three different groups of people in this scene making claims about Jesus. The first group correctly considered him the Messiah. The second, that he was empowered by demonic forces. Yikes. <laughs> but there was also a third, didn't go as far as the second, but they were like the undecideds. <laughs> And they, they wanted Jesus to do a sign to prove himself. I'm like, didn't they just see what he did? <laughs> I mean, isn't that sign enough? The, the poor man who was blind and mute was instantly healed. That's your sign. Now, I imagine John and James probably on the sidelines going, hey, Jesus, you want let, let us show him a sign. <laughs> Remember when we wanted to call fire down from heaven on the Samaritans? Let us do it right now. Please let us. I would do that, you know. Some of us, you know look at this world. Some of us look at the Olympics and we're like, Lord, just let us cast out this fire from you. I would have said, get him. Jesus, you know, he, you know, he's not going to be mocked, but he has a, he has a different way. <laughs> and he has a kind way. You know, interesting, Matthew tells us the skeptical people this day who made the allegations were the Pharisees. Like, of course, right? <laughs> of course. The Jewish religious leaders of the day, who I believed always looked like they were sucking on lemons every time Jesus was doing anything, these were the ones we know that's supposed to be encouraging the people. They were supposed to be pointing them to God. They should have acknowledged Jesus, that he was the promised one, and they should have been pointing people to him. But as many of you know, they were one of the main groups who came against Jesus, and they tried to discredit him and his ministry. And we see one of the grossest attempts right here especially by uh, accusing Jesus of being a vessel of pure evil. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've ever, like, served the Lord and, and your motives have been called into question. Like, people going, you know, you're just doing that to be seen. You know, you, you just want glory for yourself. I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, but this is like a whole other level. <laughs> and much worse because this is Jesus they're defaming. The, the only one who is perfect in all his ways, who always did the things that please the Father, who is always pure, Always holy, always just and true. You know, the religious rulers, they couldn't deny the miraculous deliverance Jesus just performed right in front of their face. But instead of acknowledging the evidence that affirmed Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one of God, they argued his power had to come from Satan. They used the name Beelzebub, which was the name of a, of a pagan god and means Lord of the Flies. But the Pharisees clearly used it to refer to, to Satan. As they even stated there that Beelzebub was the ruler of the demons. Satan is the highest rank among the fallen. The Pharisees were making the accusation that Jesus was under Satan's command. I mean, it's wild, right? But that's what hard-hearted unbelief will do. Make you say crazy things about Jesus. And like I said at the beginning, it's not a good idea to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Jesus. Because <laughs> when it comes to logic and reasoning... Jesus, he cannot be out -dueled. Look at verse 17. It says, But he, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. He says, If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Jesus knew their thoughts. He knew every intention. Why they said what they said. And he responds by saying their blasphemous claim is totally illogical. He says if he was an instrument of Satan, then Satan would be fighting against himself by using one of his soldiers to kick out another one of his soldiers. And, and Jesus says that doesn't make sense. I, if there's an in internal war, if it was allowed inside a kingdom, 
then the kingdom wouldn't survive. It would be weakened, it would end up depleted, and ultimately be, des- be destroyed. Since Satan would never try and bring his own kingdom down, Jesus argues the conclusion must be what he did in casting out the unclean spirit could not be a work of Satan, it had to be a work of God. Restoring, guys, delivering lives is a God thing. We know that, right? <laughs> Devastating and destroying lives is a devil Beelzebub thing. And Jesus argues he, he mustn't be associated with evil but with good. The Lord has a second argument, verse 19. He says, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Another insightful argument by Jesus that refutes the accusation against him. These religious rulers believed deliverances had been done by other Jews, and when they were, they would attribute that to the power of God. But now with Jesus, they are trying to claim his work was not that. His work was a work of of the devil. And Jesus says, you can't do that. (laughs) You can't do that. If you recognize God in those situations, you have to recognize God with me. He says, therefore, they will be your judges. Your inconsistent conclusion, it shows your hypocrisy. Saying God is, is in that work and Satan is in this one, when the same thing is happening, that's absurd. You know, maybe if you claimed they were influenced by Satan, they were influenced by Satan, and they were delivering by Satan, you'd have a point. But that's not what they did. So Jesus says, the charges you're making against me, they can't hold up. They're unreasonable and illogical. And then our Lord adds a third argument, the truth of the situation. In verse 20, he says, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, (laughs) surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. And surely this is the reality. It wasn't Beelzebub who empowered this this mute and, and blind man to speak and see. It was the power of God. Jesus says he delivers with the finger of God. That's an interesting phrase, the finger of God. You know, it's a phrase that should ring a bell for them, especially because they knew the Old Testament. In Exodus 8, when Moses and Aaron come before Pharaoh to deliver the children of Israel from the bondage of Egypt, God uses them to display supernatural powers with the plague judgments. But the, the, the Pharaoh's magicians, they were able to repeat some of the first ones. They were, they were able to replicate the first two judgments. But after that, they couldn't. <laughs> they couldn't do any more. And they had to concede that the mighty works they couldn't replicate, they, they say this, was, quote, the finger of God. <laughs> the same statement. The pagan magicians, they admitted it. But it says in Exodus that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. It grew hard. And he would not fall in, into surrender before the Lord. That's exactly what's taking place here with the leadership. You know, the, the multitude conceded and were in awe of the work of God by Jesus, while the Pharisees, like Pharaoh, hardened their hearts and would not acknowledge the Lord. It's the finger of God. You know, the finger of God, that statement, should have been familiar, but, but you've got to love the picture of it, right? <laughs> he did it by the finger of God, which in my mind just means that God only needed to go bling with his finger to defeat the enemy. That's all he had to do is flick him away, which again should make us conclude that Satan and, and Jesus are not equals and opposites. They are opposites in the sense that Satan is pure evil and Jesus is pure, he is holy, he is righteous, he is just, but they're not equals. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, is the all-powerful creator who has always existed, while Satan is a created being and a fallen one at that. Who Jesus has the power to bling, overcome. And you know Jesus has. Notice the Lord's illustration in verse 21. He says, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. They're protected. It's, it's, he's oversees them. It's, nothing can harm him. He says, but when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. In this brief illustration, Satan is the strong man, while Jesus is the one stronger. And what Jesus is saying is not only does his power come from God and not Satan like the Pharisees claimed, but further that, that Satan does not stand a chance against him. 
See, the strong man, Satan, he, he binds and he blinds people. Those are his goods. But Jesus, the stronger man, overtakes him <laughs> and divides the spoil, meaning Jesus has the power to set the captives free. Which reveals, guys, that the, the, the reason Jesus came into the world in the first place. Jesus came into the world to defeat the enemy and to win people back to God. And you know what? He was successful. And he's proved it. He proved it when he rescued this man and, and literally brought light to this man's dark and silent life. And spiritually speaking, he's done it with countless others, including so many in this room today that he's rescued. Amen? <laughs> Ephesians 2, even though we were dead in our trespasses and sin and walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, in bondage to him, Paul writes in Ephesians 2, we were made alive by the rich mercy of God, by, the, by his great love. He says, by grace we have been saved. You know, Jesus came to defeat the enemy, which he did when he disarmed the principalities and powers, Satan and his crew, and made a public spectacle of, of them and triumphed over them when he was victorious upon the cross in our place. See, our Lord, he has the power to save. He's done all that's needed to save. But you know, he also has the heart. <laughs> his love and grace were revealed by his willingness to come and pay the price on our behalf. We know it, Ephesians 2, 8 and, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. His grace is amazing. I mean, we know it, we sing it, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind like this man, but now I see, amen? <laughs> amazing grace is our anthem. Jesus breaking the chains of sin is what he and he alone can do. You know, he's willing to do it. The kingdom of God has come. The king has arrived. But we must acknowledge forgiveness and salvation is found in him alone. It is, it's got to be through Jesus. I mean, that's what God's word declares, right? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. And look what he says in, ver in verse 23. He says, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. This is big. This is like some straight up serious words from Jesus where he declares there can't be any neutrality. You can't be neutral when it comes to him, which is which kind of what was taking place here. Some believed, yeah, he is the Messiah. Others were flat out against him, just saying all these horrible things like we see in the world today. But there are people who sit on the fence, the undecided voters. <laughs> They're undecided. They're going to say, I'm going to sit on this fence. I don't really know. I'm going to sit on this fence, and I think I'm okay there. Jesus says you're not okay there. You cannot sit on the fence. You're either for him or against him. You know, people even try that today. I, you know, I'm just going on the fence. I'm, you know, I'm cool. They say things, you know, I've got no problem with Jesus. He's my homie. Or, you know, he's cool. I'm good with him. I really dig some of the things he says, especially when it comes to being charitable with those in need. Or, you know, I really like him when he says not to judge others. <laughs> they take it totally out of context, Right? Some of them say things like, you know, I, I don't fully follow what, what he says, but I'm, I'm cool with him. You know, I, I believe, you know, all roads lead to heaven. You know, I don't despise him like others, but, but I think I'm, I'm okay. I'm just going to stay right here. I'm right here. I'm good. Jesus says you're not good there. That doesn't work. You can't be neutral. You are either for him or against him. There's no middle ground. There's no fence to balance on. If you're on that fence, you're not on his side. <laughs> you're on one of two sides. There, there are only two sides. There's Christ's side or really the blinded side by the enemy, that side. And each person must make the choice between the two. And let me say, <laughs> Jesus' side is so much better. <laughs> I mean, anyone who's lived in both camps, can you testify with me that being in found in Jesus is so much better the hope that we have, the security that we have, the not walking in condemnation, the forgiveness, the joy that we get to experience every day. Does that mean that life is easy? No. There is that other side that we will be, be rejected by, by the world, that we will be mocked, just like our, our Lord is mocked today. But being in him is it's so much better. <laughs> you know, I, I even like the, the picture that our Lord paints with the phrases gathered and scattered. Do you see that? It says gathered and scattered. Gathered to him, are we gathered to him? We're either going to be gathered to him or we're going to be scattered. 
You know, it reminds me of what Jesus will say in a couple chapters from now when he says this. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stone those who are set, sent to her. He says this, How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood, her, her chicks, under her wings. That's what I want. He says, But you are not willing. I'm right here, just gather to me. You know, our Lord is willing to come in. He's willing to work. He is not going to force himself upon you, though. And like the crowd, each person must come to their own conclusions about Jesus. If they side with him, they get to be gathered. <laughs> they get to be gathered like, like, a, like a hen under a hen's wings, like chicks under a hen's wings. That that's, that's speaks about that covering, that protection, that safety. If not, your life will remain scattered. Literally, that word scatter can be translated to fly in every direction. <laughs> All over the place. Where you're overcome and distraught by every changing circumstance. How many people in this world are scattered? I don't know about you, but I prefer the covering of my Lord's arms. <laughs> like a hen holds onto her chicks and comforts and protects them. How about you? <laughs> Have you ever seen like a hen protect their chicks? I grew up on a farm. No, I didn't grow up on a farm. <laughs> I grew up in Southern California. I YouTubed it. That's what I did. I watched YouTube videos. Watch YouTube videos of hens protecting their chicks. They are awesome. Awesome. I'm ser seriously, Google it. I mean, YouTube it. It's like amazing. I saw a hen backing up a cow. Like, I was like, what is this? Going after goats. It even killed a hawk that was trying to get the chicks. It took it down. I was like, what? This is crazy. The best of it, though, was when I saw this hen protect its chicks from a cobra. And I'm like, how fitting. <laughs> exactly what we're reading. And it was insane. They were in this like little like room or something. And this cobra comes in, slides in, right? Sliding in. And, and, and this hen was like, you're not getting to these chicks. And I'm like, it's a cobra. Like, what are you? And it, but it kept, and one by one, the hen would fight off the, the cobra and lead the chick out. It was like, this cobra does not stand a chan chance against the hen. It's crazy. The cobra does not stand a chance against Jesus. <laughs> he is so much stronger and so much more capable. See, the answer is to be gathered to Jesus, to be under his wing, not to be scattered. When you're scattered, you're on your own. When you're scattered, you're overwhelmed and emotionally flying in every direction. And you know what? You're in the perfect place. If you're on your own, if, with your, if you're not under his wing, you're in the perfect place to be a meal for a cobra or a roaring lion who wants to devour, which is actually what we see next for those who are not gathered to Jesus, but blind and scared. This is scary. Let's look at verse 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. Talking about an individual. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Something's good again. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. I mean, if anything, <laughs> this shows the importance of finding ourselves on Team Jesus' side, <laughs> on his side. Because outside of him, there isn't that ongoing protection and safety. And Jesus brings up a scary situation that shows the most extreme of what can happen to a life that is outside of Jesus. You know, my, I don't know, my mind goes straight to Mary Magdalene, <laughs> who Luke told us at, at one point had seven demons prior to Jesus delivering her. I mean, this story adds up to eight, but still, the, the, what must have her, her experience have been? And, and you think about it. I, we are not told what Mary went through, but, but could something like this have happened where maybe she was inhabited by one, and then he flees for a while. She cleans up her life a little bit, and then that, that demon brings more to, to dwell her, and, and then she is at, at the end, at, at that place. And, and all, the only hope was Jesus, right, who had the power to do it. I mean, we don't know exactly what happened, but that's... Like, could something like that have happened? You know, reading this also makes me think, I'm so glad that the Bible teaches that Christians cannot be demon-possessed. <laughs> Some wonder, you know, can, demon, can Christians be demon-possessed? The answer is no, they can't. They cannot. The Bible teaches us uh, uh, Christians cannot be demon-possessed. I mean, I'm so glad we covered what we did last week about being sealed and, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, because he won't allow any evil spirit to come in if we are believers. 
See, the Holy Spirit isn't looking for messy roommates, right? <laughs> and when he takes up residency inside of us, he places a no-occupancy sign. He says, the rooms are full <laughs> by me. <laughs> the Apostle John even, go, even states this in 1 John 5, 18, talking about the believer, he says, the wicked one does not touch him. So Christian, do not fear. <laughs> Can I open my door and go outside? Or no, no you're, you're fine. <laughs> God wants to use you outside of your door, by the way. You don't have to fear. They can't have access to you. Can you be attacked? Yes, you can be attacked. But again, God is greater. That's what we call it. God is greater, right? I even believe our God is so gracious that he protects even the unbeliever from being fully overtaken by demons. But you know what? People can't open themselves up. This is real. It's real. People can open themselves up if they continue to pursue evil things. But you know what we can also take from, from Jesus' words is that it's possible if you look closely, it's possible for someone to be delivered from a destructive life of spiritual bondage, be set free, only to find themselves later in a similar condition that could be even worse. I mean, and we see it. I mean, how many people, how many people can clean up their lives? They can clean up their lives in one area that is, that's dishonoring of God, only to find themselves under a, another Satan-influenced bondage. Maybe it's, you know, it's an addiction. They have an addiction or, or, or an overbearing behavior that they overcome. They, they overcome it. But then they scatter, they fly in a different direction to, to, to something else. When they need to fill them, themselves with Jesus. <laughs> That's the only, there's a vacuum. There, there, there can't, it's a vacuum. It's got to be filled with Jesus. The whole needs to be filled with Jesus. And you know, maybe some of us, we've been praying, like, Lord, deliver them from this horrible sin that they're living in. They're, they're in the bondage to this. Deliver them from that. And then they could be delivered, but then they could go right into something else. And you're like, deliver them from that. We need to be praying that they would be filled with Jesus, <laughs> that they would come to saving faith. That's what we need to be praying. I believe Jesus is showing us that working real hard to reform in life is not the answer. Redemption is the answer. Being born again is the answer. Because you're filling yourself with the Lord. He comes in. That's the answer. Surrendering one's life over to Jesus is the only answer. In him, we can know the truth, and the truth will set us free. He is the one who brings life and light. He makes us new creation. The only answer for true spiritual deliverance is a person. His name is Jesus. <laughs> and I, I know we look at this world, and we see things. We look at what's going on, and we're like, oh, Lord, we need reformation. We need moral reformation. We don't need moral refor reformation. We don't. We need an awakening. <laughs> People need Jesus. People need him. That's going to correct it. You could just keep, you could be moral, but you could be lost. And you could be filled with something else. What we need is Jesus to transform hearts and lives. Amen? The only answer is Jesus. He is greater and more powerful than all, and he is willing to bring people out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Any and everyone who will acknowledge him. That's what he shows us in this passage. And, and that's what he shows them. The people in this passage, they have the opportunity to respond. And it's so awesome. One person, they can't hold back. Look at verse 27. It says, and it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. I love this because it almost sounds like this random moment of praise. This, ah, for you. You know, like maybe she's freaked out with the whole demon stuff going on. Oh, I'm for you. Okay, I'm going to make decisions right now. I'm siding with you. And blessed be your mother who, you know, gave birth to you because you are awesome. You are the answer. And he is. And his mom, Mary, was blessed for sure, right? I mean, even the angel Gabriel proclaimed it. He said in, in Luke 1, 28, Rejoice, highly favored one, to Mary. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Which wasn't because she was sinlessly perfect, but because she was called to carry the sinlessly perfect one. The one who had the power and grace to come and save humanity. But look at Jesus' response in verse 28. But he said, he said more than that. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. <laughs> Jesus is not dissing Mary, just so you know. Yeah, she's all right. No, he's not saying that. But he's putting everyone in the same boat, including Mary. That what matters most is receiving and believing this. That's what matters most is receiving and believing what this teaches beginning with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
the true life and, and, and purpose and completeness is found in him and him alone. That in him, there is life. In him, there is freedom. We become new creations if we give our life. We are born again, born from above. And he came into this world to save and deliver, to defeat Satan and graciously save all who will receive him. The question Where are you? (laughs) Are you gathered under his wing? Or are you scattered everywhere? I like being right on the fence. You can't be on the fence. There's no fence. There's no fence. You're either on his side or you're against him. Have you made the decision? to have your life found in him. If you haven't, he's willing. (laughs) He's willing to save you. He desires you. All you need to do is acknowledge him. I like this part. I like this. I like the cafeteria kind of thing. I'm going to eat this, the chicken, especially the fried chicken. Like that part of it. Or you know, like the steak, the Brussels sprouts, not so much. Beets, never entering this mouth. No, we got to take it all. We got to take it all. And if you don't believe, man, he'll work those things out. Oh, this is who I've been my whole life. He can change it. You don't have to muster up all your strength to do it. He changes you from the inside out. All you need to do is submit yourself to him. I mean, surrender yourself to him. And you will be a new creation. The Holy Spirit will come in. He will give you the strength every single day to walk in him. And you'll be protected <laughs> for anything. The evil one does not touch him. God is greater. He's our dad. And he will protect us. I mean, I know, you guys know, I love my kids. Talk about them too much, I don't care. Um, (laughs) I'll do anything. So will our dad. He did everything, right? He did everything. Send his only begotten son. If you don't know him, (laughs) invite him in. Open your heart to him. He'll come in. Oh, how I want to gather you. Like a hen gathers its chicks. But you are unwilling. Are you willing now? receive him. I think for some of us, I, I'm kind of at this point where I'm like, I mean, some of us need to grow up. I'm stuck in meeting first. We need to grow up. We could, go, we could be pointing the finger at people, right? Where they say, you point a finger at someone, there's three pointing right back at you, right? Oh, they need to change this. We need moral reformation. This. We need this. And this. Oh, yeah, me. <laughs> what are you doing to me? What are you asking of me? If he's my Lord, I need to submit myself to him. Lord means master. He's my master. I follow where he leads. I pick up my cross daily and follow him. It's challenging. But again, if you are in Christ, if you have a relationship with him, it's so much better. He came to give life and life more abundantly. Which isn't that Ferrari that I'm always waiting for. It's him filling my life, being with me every step of the way. When I'm going through difficult things, he's there for me. He's building me up. He's giving me the strength that I need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which is meaning the difficult things. It's times of suffering, times of hurry. I I can do all things through him. Where are you? Don't leave here without responding to him. If you need prayer, we're going to be up here praying. If you need to just confess your sin, confess. He will hear you. He will hear you. Lord, thank you for your love. We thank you for this day. And I just pray, God, I pray first and foremost, if someone doesn't know you, Lord, if they're overwhelmed, if they're scattered, frantic, or that they would just acknowledge you, that they can know that they could be set upon the rock, that they could be gathered together like a hen gathers their chicks under your wing, and they can have life more abundantly that they can know that they're not alone, that they don't have to have all the answers because you are the answer. And I pray even right now that if someone just wants to open their heart up to you, Lord, that they would just acknowledge you, acknowledge their need for you, 
Maybe even pray. Lord, I'm a sinner. In need of a Savior. And you are that Savior. I believe, Jesus, you came, you died, you rose bodily on the third day. You conquered death. And you're alive. You want to make me alive spiritually. I see my need. I confess my sin. I turn towards you. I repent. And you will forgive me. And I thank you for for forgiveness. It only comes through you. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you for eternity with you in heaven. That's promised. And thank you that you're with me every step of the way. In Jesus' name. For us, Lord, I just pray. We would make you the priority that we would be on your side. That we'd walk in you and trust you and know that we are safe in your arms and that you're with us completely. Maybe some of us need to turn towards you again instead of looking at all the other things but you. And our gaze needs to be set upon you. Set our minds on things above. Set our minds on you. Thank you for being so good, so faithful, so caring, so merciful, so gracious, so loving. We honor you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand? Let's go out proclaiming praises to the Lord. If you need prayer, come forward. If you're like, what is, what is Christianity about? Just come forward. It's about life, true life. <laughs> it's about Jesus. Amen? God bless you.